Welcome everyone and welcome to the virtual breakfast sessions. You know, we always talk about special events and special this and special that. Well, I, I can't tell if the rest of your day is going to be special, but I can guarantee that the next 45 minutes or so will be wonderful for you because today we're having coffee with Liz Newmark. Hello, Liz. Good morning, Larry. <laughs> How are you? Please, uh, before we go to you, uh, Fred, tell them who you are. Good morning. I'm Fred Clashman, publisher of Total Food Service. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Okay. Liz, Liz, yes. you and I had a wonderful conversation last week that I learned a little bit more about you. Um, you are, you know, the, Robert Frost wrote about uh, the road less traveled. Um, you forgot about the road and you cut your own path. Um, in reading your biography, I saw that you have a degree in urban studies. And um, like every urban studies major, when you left school, you, you formed a staffing company to place out of work actors as waitresses how did that come about <laughs> that's a that's a good question and i think you said we had 45 minutes so we could talk about this for the next several hours um but no i'll give you i'll give you that that short sort of response um I, first of all if anybody remembers that time the late 70s uh the city was not in a in a really strong position and going out into the field of urban studies was not the kind of thing that was going to result in lots of job opportunity. But more importantly, I fell in love with photography after I graduated and wanted to pursue a career in the arts. And to make ends meet, I looked to the hospitality world, which was really not welcoming to women. Uh, there was what we called the audition couch, which did not appeal to me. Um, and I had some background in temp placing office temps and thought this was a great model. Uh, and it was a means to an end. It was, let me do this short time, find opportunities for women, other friends of mine in the arts. And we were all not out of work. We were in between employment opportunities. And, uh, and this would help us, uh, you know, sort of make ends meet in a flexible way. And, uh, you know, I always say I failed at the end and succeeded at the means because had I really succeeded, I would be the next Annie Leibovitz and we'd be talking photography. Uh, but instead I was seduced uh, by the hospitality industry. And that was the first big pivot in my life. So there's, you know, we all travel down these interesting roads and, and um, never know what's really around the corner. And I didn't know, but here I am. Okay, so natural prog progression once again. Um, how did you jump from staffing to catering? <laughs> right. Um, and catering also, when we started the business, it was about 1980. Um, there was no real catering industry. And I think one day we're talking, I was talking to a hostess who was booking our servers. And she said, by the way, uh, can you bring the hors d'oeuvres? And, you know, us in the hospitality industry, no is not in our vocabulary. So we said, sure. Uh, and there were caterers who were using our staff. We knew where to go to get the hors d'oeuvres to bring them. And it just occurred to us, hey, uh, there's something here. So in 82, we built our first little kitchen down on Crosby Street. It felt very natural. Yeah, okay, okay. All right. And uh, so how do you build, go from a little kitchen on Crosby Street to 61,000 square feet off the major Deegan in the Bronx? Well, you go by subway. No. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, practice, practice. Uh, 
you know, it's been a 40 year journey. So nothing happened overnight. I mean, I think there were moments of great leaps, like getting our first contract with a cultural institution. That was a seminal moment. Uh, moving from Crosby Street over to Hudson Square, which was the printing district then uh, at $12 a square foot and just taking a leap. You know, it's interesting in talking to, to folks who are looking to come into our industry and build business and entrepreneurs, everybody says, you know, how do I do it? You know, the plans and we tell people they've got to do this projection and this business plan and that business plan. I don't think I ever did a business plan. And yes, times have changed and people have to be a little more circumspect nowadays. But I was able to, to follow my heart and follow my instinct. And, and there was so much love and passion in our team that we just kept going, not thinking about, um, you know, sticking to a plan. It's, it's, and it just reinforces how I feel. It's, it's really, I'm, I'm blessed and lucky to be able to enjoy this journey and the discovery and the exploration. And, uh, and that hasn't changed in, in all these years. You've, you've always been about the people that, that work with you. Can yes. you talk about, I mean, you talk about anybody that's worked with you, talk about anybody that's sold product to you. I mean, marketplace loves you. Um, wow. why, what, where, where, did the, where did it dawn on you that this was a people business and not a real estate business? <laughs> Uh, or a, uh, a commodity business. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I, I think I look at my influences in my life uh, and I look at my grandparents and I look at my dad who was a small scale entrepreneur in a family business. And uh, my dad, uh, who's 95, still lives in the house uh, apartment where we grew up. Uh, he was in the uh, diamond business where people exchanged tens of thousands of dollars of goods on a handshake. And it was all about relationships and who his father was. And, and, uh, and my paternal, my maternal grandfather was uh, a lawyer who could have been a judge. And he said, no, because I don't want this to interfere with my philanthropy. And it's just always been about community and relationships. And, and I think, you know, you see, you see people in our industry it's it's um it's about trust and it's about going that extra mile and and um and values so you know when i think about about people i consider partners it's everybody from our landlord down at 304 hudson street uh, trinity who i called a partner for 26 years it's party rental who's a partner it's baldor who's a partner uh it's it's so many of our vendors who are partners who've carried us through thick and thin and high and low and there have been scary times um and and then later you know we i don't I'm, i want to give everybody a break from me talking on but you know we have folks who are here working together with us 10 20 years we have second gen in our serving pool interesting how many people do you uh, do you employ? A lot, a lot. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think full time we're 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 I think we're in the two fifty two seventy five, and then on the hourly we're in the hundreds and hundreds. Okay. You know, full part time. And you have you have two very different businesses. You have a an on you have a contracting business in which you handle food service and special events for cultural institutes, et cetera. Then you correct. also have an extensive off-prem business as well, correct? Yes, which I finally call that the one night stand business. Okay, oh, that's funny, that's <laughs> funny. I hope that's still a relevant expression, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> so talk a little bit about the, the differences between those, those two spaces that you operate in. Okay, uh, you know, we always look at whatever project we're doing because there are a few more um, little verticals that we're involved in, such as special events and concessions, things like that. Everything ties back to our core competency, which is uh, a catered event. So when we are doing contracts with cultural institutions, we're doing their public food service, we're doing concessions, we're doing internal events, which might be development, board of directors, galas, 
and then we do parties uh, for external clients uh, who really dovetail with our one night stand business because, you know, take um, General Motors, for example, they might come to Jazz at Lincoln Center and rent the space for an event, but then they might go off premise uh, to some park and, and do an event. So there's a lot of fluidity in terms of the clients in both sectors. The, different, the key difference is that um, it's a very deep relationship on the contract side because you have one client which is producing lots and lots of business, but you have to maintain that, that core relationship. Uh, and, and we love that because like I said before, we're really about relationships. And their needs are different than the one night stand business. And I, and I would suspect too, from a, from a P&L standpoint, in the contract business, you have no guarantee. I mean, you're on the hook every day that guests and customers are actually going to show versus in an off-prem where you already have the deposit. You know, it's yeah, a very- this, Go ahead. There's a little risk on the contract side. I think what we've seen, and, and I'm sure other operators will affirm this, because of the risk and because of the volatility of the market the last several years, we're seeing uh, a shift to uh, fee-based operations. Um, so, you know, that's interesting. I'd say the market is is really splitting along those lines. Right. And, and what about, I, you know, I guess the, the, one of the, the key questions becomes, are people going to go back to work in offices? And how is that, and how is corporate dining going to evolve as this hybrid model finds its way? What do you, what do you see? What do you think? Well, first of all, I'd like to say, I think everybody should be back in the office six days a week. Okay. That aside, I, I, I am a realist and I understand that in just a few cities, because most of the country, people are back. It's New York, it's San Francisco, Los Angeles, these outliers, these crazy cities like ours where people are not back. Um, and I think I'll also say it took years to get into this whole, we're not getting out anytime soon, but I would like to believe that two more years we'll see a shift uh, from a cultural productivity perspective, from a real estate perspective, I, I don't think this is flexibility is here to stay, but but I think we'll get better than 52% back in the offices. Okay. Um, having said that, it's interesting because whereas it might affect our contract business because we are feeding companies and employees in offices, the need to gather employees and work colleagues is more important than ever. So if we're gonna lose it on the contract side, I think we're gonna pick it up on the special event side because you have to bring people together. I mean, how do you have a, a work community where people don't know each other? It just, I, 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 I can't get my head around that. So um, I think that's one trend that we're feeling. And the other is, on those three days a week that people are in the office, it's gonna really ask us all to lean into creativity uh, with what we're bringing to the table, how to make it more meaningful, less of uh, what the industrial corporate theater world might bring and lean into things that we're doing. We absorbed into our kitchen, a wonderful company called Eat Off Beats, they're refugee chefs cooking food from their country. So we have clients who say, okay, Tuesday, I would love to have eat off beats. That's not hard for us to do. Um, we have an incredible program called People's Kitchen where our culinary ambassador, Georgette Farkas has helped us uh, build relationships with dozens of small restaurateurs, a lot of WMBE makers and, and innovators. And we bring them into our program and it's easy for us. So. You know, we're not bound by corporate structure about where we need to buy our food from. And, and so it's, it, it makes it easy for our clients because call us and we can bring our whole merry band of uh, creators with us. I have a question for you. You mentioned that you have people working for you for 20 years plus, and you have second generation people working for you. Why? Why in an industry where 
everything is transient. You know, you hire a chef today and he's gone tomorrow. Um, if he shows up. <laughs> right, if he shows up. Why are people staying with you for 20 plus years? Well, first of all, I just want to be say that we have the folks who come for a day and never show up again. Uh, we have a real blend of, of, of people who are short terms, new, you know, and I love fresh blood because I think that's so important. But why people stay? Um, because we're a family. Uh, I'd like to think we're sensitive to people's needs. We've bent over backwards to accommodate the working mothers in our in our company. Um, we are more mission driven, and I think that speaks to a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of humanity. People can bring their creativity. Um, you know, the lunch is good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we we. we it's it's and 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 we lose people you know we we have people who go over to other companies they leave new york they go to the competition whatever but i, I i'd like to think that we're not just focused on a bottom line that there's really a lot of room for for people to grow i mean our senior team it's so interesting um it's half you know folks who've been here over 12, 15 years, and, and then the other half is, is, is fresh blood and new, new people, which is so critical. Are you doing any neighborhood outreach? Oh, a lot, a lot. Can you explain, uh, explain that program? Sure. So uh, we loca relocated in 2019 to the South Bronx, to Mott Haven. Uh, I think everybody thought I'd lost my mind. Um, we have not. I think this has been called by Cranes the It District, which I don't know how I feel about that. Um, but we've done tremendous outreach to different workforce development programs. We're connected with Hostos. We're connected with Bronx Works. We're connected a uh, wonderful company upstairs, Grant Associates, and trying to find uh, our neighbors in the Bronx to come in and look at hospitality. I think we're all thinking about this as a place not only to come through uh, an entry level position, but to grow with. And I think it, it, it sort of reflects the other big trend we see in a lot of the corporate world, which we want diversity. We want to have a staff that looks like the uh, New York. Um, and, and, and sort of have that evolution as well. So I, I'm all in on the Bronx and, and we do hiring from you know citywide because so much of our work is, is not in the Bronx. We have a lot of clients. So of course, you know, focus in Manhattan, we do a lot of work in Brooklyn. Um, so we're, we're open geographically to everyone, even those folks from New Jersey, uh, we have a whole contingent, but it, it's amazing to see this borough. I, I like to say, um, you know, after, I'm a third generation Manhattanite, and now I call myself a, a Bronx immigrant. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about developing talent from within? Um, when you have an open position, can you tell the tell us the uh, the process? Any open position is posted uh, on the website. It's posted internally. If we can fill from within that is the best way most of our you know it's interesting when we were all coming up in the industry you started you know taking out the garbage loading the truck you know passing the tray that's how you learn the industry there was no it was like the school of life as opposed to the training program and i think that fell off as the industry exploded people could just come in uh at any level and not have that deep background. So when we have people who start and work their way up, it is so fabulous because they've gone through the quote unquote, the training program already. Um, and that said, there's not enough, there, there are not enough people internally to move up to all the positions we have. So, you know, we, we do go outside as, as often as we go inside. So Liz, as, as we look, five years, 10 years down the road, if we don't have an intelligent immigration policy, uh, where is this diverse 
population going to come from to come to work for you and for other people in our industry? Well, I, I don't think we've really uh, gone as deep as we can with our local non-hospitality okay. communities. Uh, and uh, Larry was telling me we don't talk politics, but I think fixing our immigration policy is, is just so smart because as you know, we have a farm. I can tell you what's happening in the agricultural community. Americans are not lining up to, to, to take care of our farms and harvest right. our food. Uh, and not that that should belong to immigrants, but that's a it's a big issue um i think we have to go deeper one of the boards i sit on the fund for public housing uh we work with residents and provide programs for public housing residents they in in everything from real estate banking working with cuny hospitality there's a huge pool of talent and young people who would love the hospitality industry. It's just never really been a pathway and we haven't had the means to facilitate that uh, integration. So I think there's, and, and, and I hope, I, I know the mayor is really focused on workforce development. He's got some really smart people, Abby Joe Siegel down there, um, who are looking at internships. Uh, you know, there's SYEP, you know, the summer youth uh, employment program. There, there are a lot of tools, but it's going to take a lot of will because it's it's harder. It is harder. Yeah. What about, um, you, we have a question. You're also involved with a James Beard Foundation Fellows Program. Can you yes. talk about talk about that program and, and what opportunities that creates? Yeah, well, James Beard is, is talk about um, reinvention and being a, such a strong pillar for how the hospitality industry is evolving. Uh, the fellowship program really focused on students coming through uh, this alternative door into the hospitality industry. And we've worked with them, we've embraced them, they've come into the kitchen, we help prepare the boxes for the meals that people order. And um, so I've, I've met some of these young people and they are, you know, extraordinary. And it's a real counterpoint to what was when you think 10 years ago, a James right. Beard chef was probably a tall white guy. Um, and now it's all shapes, colors, sizes, genders, and, and we love it. And we, we love our relationship with James Beard Foundation, which is gonna continue down to Pier 57. Okay. All right, any questions from the audience? You've been very quiet except for one question today. Uh, you've got an expert here. What? <laughs> if you don't have a question, I have a few. So Liz. Yes. Let's talk about your babies, the farm and the charity. <laughs> okay. You know, we, we like you, we, we were talking about urban studies and you said you've come full circle. And yeah. let's talk about uh, your, your two children. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the farm, I, I'd like to think every every New York City kid wants to have a farm. Um, <laughs> it was funny, for years, my dad said, we need a farm, we need a farm. And when I told him that we had a farm, he asked me about it. I said, yep, it's 60 acres. He said, 60 acres? I just meant like, you know, a little corner or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> like too late. Typical I, parent. <laughs> yeah, um, the farm is uh, the realization of a, of, of, I guess, some strong misplaced gene that I inherited, uh, wanting to connect to to the land, and and as we grew as a company, food becomes so much more of a commodity, and I really wanted us to to stay connected to agriculture, seasonality, where our food comes from how mindful it is to grow food uh, and, and our need far outstrips anything we could ever produce at Kotschke. Uh, but but it's, an, it's, it's sort of like an anchor for us. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. And the other reason I, I wanted the farm is because we wanted to launch this um, nonprofit called the Sylvia Center, which teaches children how to cook. And it's really sort of a stealth health organization because if you're on a limited budget and you don't know how to cook you take your five dollars you go to Popeye and you get a bucket of chicken which over time will kill you 
Uh, and I don't believe in telling people or kids in particular, you can't have fried chicken because that doesn't work. But if we can get those kids and we get them in after school programs and we teach them how to cook and we introduce them to tastes and flavors and we empower them, they have agency and, and pride. And, and then we start to work with their families. You, we, 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 we change the trajectory of what ends up on their plates. So the farm was, was very much part of that. And, and then um, through the Bloomberg administration, we got funding to go into NYCHA after school programs. And, and the majority of the program here now is with different after school programs all around the city. Um, and the other nonprofits I work with, Grow NYC, I'm on the board, which I think we all know is an incredible organization supporting farmers, supporting access to healthy food for all New Yorkers. Um, <laughs> I have a few other boards I sit on. I mentioned the Fund for Public Housing, Open House New York, which just everybody write it down, go look at it. I won't talk about it, but it's extraordinary. Uh, and then, and then, of course, working hard for the Bronx on our Chamber of Commerce. So, so my loves are tying back exactly to to where we started, which was urban studies and you know political activism. I, when I grow up, I want to make the world a better place. You're it's doing it. Naive and simple, but it, it's a uh, it's kind of fundamental. Yes, yes. And we do it with food. You know, food is is. You know, I tell I tell our kids or even adults, you know, with every bite you take, with every fork full of food, you are voting, you are making choices, you are sending messages, you are using your power. And I know it's a little naive and simplistic, but it really does matter. Well, what a segue. It's, you must <laughs> be intuitive. We got a question from Cherry, and Cherry asked, how is food as medicine concept affecting the catering business? Well, that's a great question. Um, and it's really interesting. And I think it just reflects the dichotomy we see in so many different ways in our society. So everybody talks about wanting healthful food. I have a pretty clean diet, more or less. Um, but when it comes down to it and the numbers, uh, you know, we have an expression, there's never a line at the, at the veggie truck. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I know that because we had a, a farm truck. You can see that's the retired license plate. Um, so people line up for the hamburgers, the hot dogs, the junk food, the, the, the comfort food, the soul food, um, the really good, wicked stuff. But it's a long game. And thinking about wellness, health, the impact of what we're eating, food is medicine, um, is it's 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 a flog. Uh, I try to talk to clients about options and educate them, but it's you know again it goes back to our fundamental principles at the Sylvia Center. I can't I don't tell people what to eat and what they can't eat. We do it by uh, offering choices, romancing palates, and you know, every day hopefully taking a new step. Uh, you know, I'd love to share about our cafe downstairs. Is um, we opened a small cafe at the base of our building, the Meme Cafe and Plant Store. So it's half a plant store, and all the food is plant based. And because we're in the South Bronx, it has a Latin twist. We're surrounded by construction workers because all these buildings go up. If we served a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich, there'd be a line out the door every day. And we don't. Um, so there's no line. But we see visitors coming in from all over the Bronx and sort of saying, you know, sort of flocking to this notion of healthy, delicious, alternative food. We probably lose a little bit of money every day, but it's the long game. Are the numbers going up? 
Yeah, they are because we signed on to Grubhub and whatever else, you know. Well, does, so what, so, so I what, think the what's on that is. menu? Because Larry and I have spent <clears throat> a lot of time trying to talk about how a restaurateur can add plant-based to a menu. <laughs> Excuse me, what's on that menu that's delicious well, and unusual? And, and, and talk a little bit about that for a second. Okay, well, our number one item is um, we have this amazing mushroom taco and also a mushroom burrito that tastes like meat. It is just so savory and juicy and delicious. Um, so that's like a very hearty item. There's just a lot of, um, there's some Jamaican dishes that we have that are just a lot of um, legumes and some veggies. Uh, I'm trying to think what else is, I mean, I always go for the mushroom tacos, so I don't yeah. even know what else is. Uh, but there's salads and and uh, 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 our salsas. We make our we grow our own hot sauce. Uh, so whatever you like, put a little hot sauce on it. It doesn't matter. It's all about the hot sauce. Uh, so it's and then of course you know the, the beverages, the, a whole range of fresh fruit juices and and. Um, and you know what, even things that are a little evil, like a delicious Mexican Coke, that's my go-to right. sinful treat. <laughs> Nothing like a pile of sugar to help the mm. vegetables go down. <laughs> a little cane sugar, agreed. <laughs> oh, okay, you know, this has been wonderful. Uh, I, I, once again, I've learned more about you and more about the business. Uh, do you have, if there were one, thing just one thing you'd like to stick in everyone's head right now what would that be that is a tough question <laughs> it's my job well you know <laughs> it, it 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 might not even be related to the food go ahead and like, okay, I think we're all back in the office. So it's not about, hey, get back to work. Uh, and I think every day is, uh, is an opportunity that has to be lived to the fullest. What I have learned from, from, from my uh, journey is that life is hard, work is hard, you know, I've made it sound like it's a little love fest here, but it's tough. You know, people deal with all kinds of stuff. Um, and making every day count. It's, I mean, it's, it, it's really simple. Uh, doing good, doing good to people. Ugh, it's, it sounds so goody goody, but, uh, you know, being mindful, uh, making change, believe in what you believe and fighting for it. It's beyond industry. So just uh, like I said, make it, make it, it there's no do-overs. Today's gone, when it's over, yep. Yep. you don't get it back. Great, great. Well, Liz, thanks for spending time with us. Audience, thanks for coming. Um, May I this, send an invitation to everybody to come up here to the South Bronx and feel the vibe uh, and the excitement of this community, spend a little money up here. I'll treat you to a mushroom taco. To <laughs> say Larry, Larry sent me. That'll be the Sounds like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, so remember, you all owe me a favor now uh, because I got <laughs> you a free taco. It's the first time we have had a giveaway on the show. It's uh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful. Liz, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure once again. And uh, audience, thanks for coming. Uh, we will be back here in two weeks. We're going to change gears a bit. We're going back to the virtual breakfast session. And that session in two weeks will be forget about plan B. Do you really have a plan A? <laughs> Don't listen to what Liz said. <laughs> Liz said it's all in her head. It don't. Yeah. Say, it takes a very <laughs> special person. And Mr. Dorn says you need a you need a business plan. So we're gonna, that's, that, that's where we're going to start. 
that's we're going to start there. So listen, folks, I hope to see you back in two weeks. Liz, I promised I'd get you out on time. And I think uh, we've, we've accomplished our mission. So once again, everybody, thanks for coming. And Bye. until I see you the next time, stay positive, test negative. See you in two weeks. Thanks, Larry. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Thank you.